Hey there everybody, it's Mark Crowley. I'm back with another video. This is the latest in my ongoing series of videos about how to create comics, uh, but it also includes a lot of information about storytelling in general. Today's topic is going to be main characters. I'm going to talk about the six different main characters that I have created over the years. My very first comic book that I created way back in the early 90s, The Beast That Ate Morioka, is where we're going to begin. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into it. So here we have uh, Hiroshi Okada, the main character of the story. And what I'm going to do is give you two pieces of advice for each one of these properties that I created. Here's number one. Your main character may require a friend character. Conversations with that friend help you give information to the reader. And uh, sure enough, even on this first project, uh, I began with just Hiroshi on his own, going through these experiences by himself. But by the end of the second page, I already understood, we got to get a friend in here uh, to make the story more interesting, and also uh, to give Hiroshi someone to talk to. Uh, if he's not uh, talking to anybody, we don't get to... Uh, hear anything from him and uh, it can be crucial really just as an elegant way of uh, getting information to the reader. Uh, give them a friend character, they start having conversations and in a much more interesting way than just straight up narration uh, you can get crucial pieces of information to the reader. Number two, there is power in a cartoony character who suddenly gets serious at a key part in the story. Uh, so in this uh, story, I had uh, Hiroshi, uh, the main character, drawn in a very cartoony way, generally presented in a fairly light-hearted way, but during this climactic sequence, uh, we come to a moment where his pet monster uh, is, uh, you know, apparently going to be killed uh, by the military by way of this elaborate scheme, and uh, Hiroshi suddenly is climbing down the cord, um, ready to sacrifice his life. It's, it's really quite heavy if you stop and think about it. And there is something about uh, having drawn him in such a cartoony way, having presented him in a light-hearted way, there is an extra added power there when he suddenly switches and we can take him seriously or be sort of concerned for him uh, as a real flesh and blood character. And uh, that was a learning experience for me as a creator and uh, in my subsequent stories, again and again, I would take my cartoony characters and uh, allow them to become a little serious at certain points in the story. So now we come to the Akiko series. This was a much uh, bigger project for me. It began as a comic book series, uh, and it eventually became um, a series of prose fiction novels for uh, Random House children's books. And uh, as uh, I had done with the earlier project, I'm going to give you two different pieces of advice uh, relating to what I learned about the main character for these stories. Number three, your main character may need to act as an audience surrogate. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard this term before, basically it means that uh, the, the person watching the movie or reading the book uh, is experiencing it by way of the main character. They can kind of put themselves in the shoes of the main character, and definitely Akiko uh, was like that for this series. She was a fourth grade girl, she went on this adventure, and I was always sort of aware of uh, the audience being able to see things from her point of view and go on this uh, crazy adventure. Um, you know, just as Alice uh, went uh, down the rabbit hole or as Dorothy went over the rainbow, you've got this main character that is allowing the audience to see things from a particular point of view and sort of imagine themselves going on the same journey. So, you know, as long as you're aware of that, you can take full advantage of it uh, in the writing. Uh, let's move on to one more piece of advice. Number four, your side characters may turn out to be more flashy than your main character. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Here you see the four uh, side characters that I created for the Akiko series, Mr. Biba, Poog, Spuckler, and his robot Gax. Um, and uh, just looking at them visually, they are more interesting uh, than Akiko, more unusual in terms of their design. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's common for the main character, as the audience surrogate, to be a little bit neutral. Um, kind of like Charlie in uh, Charlie and the Cho Chocolate Factory. Charlie is the sort of normal, ordinary character. Everyone 
everyone else is a little more flashy, a little more extreme in their personality traits. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's like if you try to take Willy Wonka and make him the main character, it becomes challenging for the audience to uh, identify with such a flashy, unusual guy. Um, so uh, don't worry if you find that your um, side characters are becoming more interesting than the main character. That's a very natural thing, uh, and you can use it to your advantage. Now we move on to Billy Click, Creech Battler. Um, certainly one of my lesser known series. There were only two books in the series. It was not so widely read. Uh, but for me, it was, uh, it was my third big project, and I put a lot of time uh, into launching it. Let's look at two different pieces of advice uh, that I learned from this series. The beginning of the story is often all about introducing readers to the everyday world of the main character. Uh, here in the very first Billy Click book, um, we have Billy uh, beginning to uncover uh, evidence that his parents have an alternative <laughs> identity. Uh, and uh, that eventually becomes uh, the sort of adventure of the story. But we don't have uh, any sense of what the adventure is if we don't first get to know the ordinary, uh, usually slightly boring, everyday life of the character. Uh, then we get that contrast as they go off and have their adventures. And that's why you have, you know, sort of Luke Skywalker introduced with this boring farm boy life. You have Dorothy in Kansas. You know, you've got these, always got these introductory scenes um, that are arguably maybe a little bit boring on purpose, so that by contrast we uh, go through this experience of, uh, of how crazy things get when they go off on the adventure. So, um, you know, think twice before skipping that seemingly boring uh, beginning material. It is actually quite important in terms of uh, helping us understand the significance uh, of the adventure once it gets underway. Number six, your main character doesn't have to be cool. Trust your instincts as a storyteller. If you like the character, the readers will too. Now this is getting a little personal based on my own experiences, but uh, with Billy Click, uh, this was the one time where the, the editor and the publisher kind of got super involved uh, early on, and they pressured me to change the character into this sort of extreme sports <laughs> skateboarder dude, uh, which was not what I originally wanted him to be. Uh, and as I look back on my creative life, I do sort of regret having given in uh, to that pressure because I ended up with a character that I myself couldn't really identify. I'm not, you know, uh, uh, an extreme sports guy. This, uh, this all, was all me trying to create a character to please the publisher. Uh, so I would advise you, based on my experience, if you ever find yourself in such a uh, situation, uh, be strong and uh, trust your instincts because you can't write a story about uh, a character that someone else thinks is interesting. They've got to be interesting to you. So now we come to Miki Falls. Uh, I guess this would technically be my fourth big project, but I would say uh, in truth that it was my second really big project because, um, you know, Billy Click and uh, The Beast That Ate Morioka are both relatively minor in terms of length and amount of work that went into them. I put a lot of work into Miki Falls. It ended up being about 670 pages altogether, and I learned a lot of things from the project. So let's go ahead and get to the first of them. Number seven, when trying to work in a new style, give yourself extra time to get it right. Now, most of these uh, pieces of advice are sort of writing related. This one is more drawing related. Uh, when I did Mickey Falls, I wanted to begin working in a manga-influenced style, and I was very excited about it, uh, but I think I jumped in a little too quickly uh, before realizing uh, what the proper balance of uh, facial features needs to be in a manga style. And uh, somewhat notoriously, I ended up with a, a character whose chin was a little too big, and <laughs> just the, the placement of the facial features within the face, uh, looking back now, just looks a little off to me. And I do wish that I would have given myself a little more time to uh, sort of figure out what looks best prior to beginning the series. So there's, uh, you know, hopefully something where... <laughs> I can save other people <laughs> based on my own missteps. <laughs> Do as I say, not as I did. Number eight. If your main character is the narrator, be cautious of having them refer to things that haven't happened yet. Uh, Miki was definitely the narrator of this story. It's a common thing to do to have the main character telling the story. 
Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, but you've got to be careful about what gets into the narration. Here's an example of uh, hopefully doing it right. Uh, I kept my eyes on Hiro. I knew that if my eyes left his for even a second, it would all be over. We're in the scene. We're in the moment. She's, uh, she's basically... Um, not revealing that she knows how it all ends. <laughs> uh, inevitably, when your main character is narrating the story, we do sort of uh, know instinctively that, th that they're telling it all in the past tense and they know how everything ended up, but you don't want to remind the reader of that any more uh, than you have to. Um, you may be tempted sometimes to, to have them say something like, uh, you know, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but that guy would end up being one of my worst enemies. Now, you know, you got to be real careful about something like that, because you're, you're yanking the reader out of the story, and you're reminding them of the fact that you know how uh, things are going to turn out. Uh, so think very carefully before you do anything like that, before you have the narration refer to events that are you know, ahead in the chronology, because it, it can be, it can really mess things up in terms of uh, the reader being fully engaged uh, in the moment that you're describing. And now we come to Brody's Ghost, uh, my most recently completed uh, big project. Uh, not quite as many pages as Mickey Falls, but uh, a close second in terms of uh, length of a single story. And uh, in this one, uh, again, I learned many things, uh, and I want to share uh, at least two of them with you right now. Number nine, when your main character suffers, the audience feels more connected to them. Uh, their failures can be more interesting than their successes. Uh, Brody, in Brody's Ghost, definitely suffers a lot all the way through the whole story. I would say more, really, than any other character in any of my stories. Right from the beginning, he's in a rough situation. Uh, and uh, in this scene, he is defeated by a mere child uh, in battle. The whole point of the story is to show that, uh, or of this particular scene, was to show that Brody's no good at fighting uh, at the outset of the story. Um, and uh, interestingly, this kind of suffering on the part of the main character does make them more interesting uh, to the reader and gets the reader more invested in the outcome of the story. Uh, if your main character is kind of an in indestructible superhero James Bond kind of a guy who never suffers, who never fails, um, the, the reader may feel that they're kind of uh, kept at an arm's length distance uh, from that character. So don't hesitate to give uh, your main character a lot of uh, struggles, a lot of setbacks, uh, because then the, char the, the reader begins to really root for them and uh, become more invested in seeing them overcome these difficulties. Number 10, give your character an emotional journey as well as a literal one. Now, Brody, of course, uh, goes on this kind of amazing, um, fantastical adventure by way of the ghost Talia that comes into his life. But he also is having a more um, ordinary emotional uh, story uh, of this uh, woman, Nicole, that he had been dating. She dumped him. Uh, at the beginning, you know, actually before the story even begins. And here we begin to understand why she dumped him. He has a problem with his temper. Uh, and in a way, he messed up his own uh, relationship. Uh, having some sort of human story at the heart uh, of your uh, otherwise quite imaginative um, uh, adventure uh, is going to bring the reader more uh, deeply into the story, make them care more about the main character. Make sure that there is some sort of emotional journey as well as all the sort of uh, amazing special effects. I think it's kind of the two of these things together uh, that make a story really satisfying. And now finally we come to The Drawing Lesson, my latest uh, graphic novel story, and I can't resist sharing the good news by way of this video that The Drawing Lesson has been nominated for an Eisner uh, award this year. This is the first time I've been nominated since the late 90s. Uh, what a thrill uh, to, to be in the running uh, for an Eisner Award, whether I win or not. Uh, to me, I always feel like you've been told you were one of the top five uh, of the year, 2016, within a certain category. So anyway, let's talk about the drawing lesson uh, and the lessons that I learned about this main character, David. Number 11. Some stories have more than one main character. 
In such stories, pay attention to whose point of view the reader is getting. Now, I have to admit that I initially thought that this was purely going to be told, uh, this story was purely going to be told from the point of view of David. Uh, and uh, sure enough, in the first scene, we're sort of experiencing things through his eyes. And uh, when he turns and looks and sees uh, this woman in the distance, uh, there's no question that he's the main character and she is this sort of secondary character that he's going to, um, you know, encounter and deal with throughout the story. But let's have a look at another chapter later on in the book. In chapter three, we are really seeing things from the point of view of Becky, uh, the woman that ends up becoming his teacher, and she goes into Storbeck's coffee uh, and uh, is sitting down to enjoy a relaxing afternoon and suddenly boom it's David who comes along and we're seeing things from her point of view and uh, David wants to get another lesson from her and she's like right now? Uh, definitely she is our kind of main character at the moment and a lot of the humor is derived from experiencing things from her point of view. And I have to admit this is kind of the first time I've done this. It, it, you could say that the, the drawing lesson uh, is a story with uh, dual main characters. It shifts back and forth between David and Becky um, as we go through the story and we kind of uh, begin to identify with both of them uh, even uh, as certain scenes unfold uh, we can see it from both of their points of view. So uh, there's nothing wrong with that as long as you are aware of which point of view you are presenting uh, in each chapter. You don't want to be shifting back and forth uh, from one moment to the next. That could be kind of confusing for the reader. I think you have to sort of make a decision, maybe one scene at a time. Whose point of view are we going to get? And now we come to our final piece of advice here. Number 12, an aimless main character can result in an aimless story. Usually the main character needs a clear goal that they are highly motivated to achieve. Uh, in the case of the drawing lesson, it's super clear. Uh, David wants to learn how to draw. He pretty much says it. <laughs> <laughs> very clearly in the first chapter and uh, that's the thing sort of driving the mo the momentum of the story all the way through uh, will David uh, achieve his dream of learning how to draw well and uh, in a way Brody's Ghost is an example of a story where I came dangerously close to uh, uh, presenting an aimless character uh, at the beginning he wakes up he he doesn't seem to have any particular goal um, and uh, it, it takes a while uh, into the story before he finally gets his real goal. Uh, and I don't want to give that away for those of the, who haven't uh, read the story because it could uh, prove a spoiler. But in any case, suffice to say, eventually uh, Brody gets a very highly motivating goal that he needs to achieve. And at some point uh, early in the story, you do uh, have to give your characters something that they're up against, something that they want to get. Uh, or defeat or whatever. Uh, without that, the story can become a bit of a yawn as you just go from scene to scene and we have, uh, you know, just no reason to keep turning the pages. So there's my video about main characters, uh, the different lessons that I've learned. I thought here at the end I would give you and me a sort of interesting visual experience here, placing all six of these main characters side by side to see just how much uh, my style changed from one project to the next. And I would not say that this is a progression uh, of the old rejected style towards a new permanent style. No, I'm, I'm constantly moving back and forth. You can see how close I got to sort of anatomical realism before jumping back to this cartoony style, uh, just because I thought the project uh, would be better off done in this style than done in this one. Um, and you can be sure uh, when it comes time for me to do project number seven, I'll probably come up with a uh, seventh uh, style that's different from all of the ones that you saw in this video. Well, I think it's time for me to wind things down. I want to thank you all for watching this video. I really hope you found it useful. And I'll be back with another one real soon.